First of all, we won't do any introduction on this one because this is a, a BPAA-sponsored presentation. I will tell you very quickly, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Bart Berger, and I'm part of the BPAA team from your national uh, trade show uh, organization. Just by show of hands to help me, how many of you, this is the first time you've sat in one of my presentations? Okay, so quite a few new hands. So I'll give you just about the, the half bio then. I won't give you the whole bio because uh, uh, many of you have, have been in one of the sessions before. I've been with the Trade Association now about three years. And before that, I spent 30 years in the industry doing what all of you do. I spent five years with uh, independent proprietors. Then I had the opportunity to spend 25 years with uh, Brunswick Retail, literally operating bowling centers around the world. At one time, uh, I had mainland China, Germany, Austria, and just about coast to coast in, in the U.S. And I only share that um, with you just to kind of level set because uh, one of the reasons that I was brought on to the association is to look through your eyes and, and, and represent you as we develop programs and, and think about things that are good for proprietors. So uh, I've been very blessed and fortunate to meet a lot of great people and do a lot of neat things, which has allowed me to kind of share those experiences and help with the development of programs like this. One kind of housekeeping item, if you're here today to see Carolyn, uh, don't get disappointed. She's with us via video. Uh, she'll be at the trade show booth. Um, so she's part of the program. So I know Kenny's a couple of guys going to leave. That's okay. Um, so Carolyn was an a integral part of that. She's working on some coaching items. But she's with us today via video, and that'll make a whole lot more sense as we, as we go forward here. So let's go ahead and get started. As we're passing that around, everybody should have a uh, lesson plan one and then just a little 5 by 7 POS. We should have enough for, for everybody there. So this morning, what are we going to cover? First of all, we're going to talk about what is Bowling 2.0. We'll spend a little bit of time on why now, why, why, the program, why bring this program to market today in 2013, why even mess with it. Um, I'm going to spend some time on how does it work. Most importantly, I want to talk about how you can get started. Got a little bit I want to share with you on some improving center execution. We do have some uh, testimonials and a couple of uh, centers that have uh, floored some programs, had some great success. And I've, I put Q&A down there last, but that's just more of a memory jogger for me. I will tell you that, that I want your questions at any time, OK? We've got a, got a big group, which is OK. If for some reason you're not comfortable doing questions in a big group setting, We'll be out on the trade show floor at the BPA booth. We'll have a Bowling 2.0 kiosk. So myself will be there. There'll be a couple of proprietors there. So if whatever reason today you're just not comfortable in this big group setting, you know, raising your hand, then make sure you stop by and see us. Because my goal is before you leave Expo here this week, <coughs> excuse me, before you leave Expo here this week, I want you to have all the questions that you need answered so you can integrate this into your, your marketing programs. Um, Again, just to kind of level set me to help for the group, do we have any centers here today that currently already have a 2.0 kit? So we got a couple. OK. Um, anybody here that's already run a 2.0 program? OK, so I see a couple of hands. Ted and Bob, Reggie, great. All right, so that just kind of help, help kind of level set me as, as we go forward here today. Um, so that, that's it for today. Let's get started. So let's start with the end in mind. When you get down to now, those of you that know me, I'm from the South, and I'm a guy, so I keep things very simple, all right? If somebody asks you, what is Bowling 2.0, in its simplest form, here's what it is. It's a four-week learn-to-bowl program designed to introduce new, and I want to emphasize the word new, adults 18 and older, or to reactivate folks that have not bowled in several years. Now, let me talk about this a little bit, because I think strategically this is, in, this is important. Um, there are proprietors around the country, and right now there are about, well, not about, there are 572 bowling centers that have activated and received the kit through this program. And we're hoping that we're going to add another 100 here while we're here this week. So we're at about 600 centers. Now I know in those 600 centers, because they've already started to report back in, that they're using this for youth. And that's okay. There was a wonderful youth presentation just happened here a few moments ago. If you were at the general membership meeting yesterday, you know youth was a big focus. Youth is our future. We get that. But understand that this program was designed specifically to address this decline in adult league bowlers. Now, can it be used for youth? You betcha. Are there centers around the country doing it? Yes, they are. But that wasn't the target audience, as you'll see as we go forward here. 
And the other part of that is is meant to be for new. This is not a program designed for your current league bowlers. Not that we don't love those folks, not that you don't want to do retention programs for them, but there are other things out in the marketplace for that. This is not one of them. In its simplest form, this is designed to take non-users, let them sample your product, and then convert them into a, a program, whether you call that a league, a club, I don't care what you label it, just as long as we're making the cash register ring. And if you think about that in the business model, you could substitute that for any product, okay? Our widget just happens to be league bowling or bowling. So we're taking non-users, we're letting them sample our product, and then we're converting them. It's simple, profound, but it, it really can help us and it is changing centers around the country. So I want you to think about that as we go through because that's really the model that we're working with as we, we develop this. Um, I would also add on this that uh, a couple of points here. This is really an industry initiative. Uh, this is a great example of the International Bowling Campus coming together. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without uh, USBC and the help from their coaching staff and Carolyn and the team. Wouldn't have been possible without uh, Strike 10. And of course, it wouldn't have been possible without BPA because you folks own the playing field. You're the folks that execute the program and, and, and build the league bowlers. Because uh, I'm kind of an outsider to the association. I'm not an association guy at all. I'm a, I'm a bowling guy. Um, when folks that I know often afterwards, you know, if I made this career change and came with the association, I often get people pull me aside and say, hey, Bart, you know, Tell me the truth. Is that campus thing really working? You know, and I'll tell them, yes, it is. This, is. this is an example. I will tell you that if USBC was still in uh, Milwaukee, we would still be messing around with this program. And that has, that's not anything to do with USBC or BPA. It's just about getting things done when you're face to face. Because right now, if I have an issue, I march up a flight of stairs, I look someone in the eye, and I don't leave them until I get an answer. And, and I can be in a pretty no annoying person. Right? Now, by the same token, if they need something, they can march down a flight of stairs, sit in my office, look me in the eye, and not leave until they get an answer. Whereas if you're doing things 800 miles away, and you're doing meetings and emails and conferences, I mean, that stuff all takes time. So speed to market, speed to market for this, this program, in my opinion, was phenomenal. Uh, this program was developed and brought to market for you in less than six months. It was launched at Summit, where we had a soft launch as we introduced it to the industry at our gathering in San Antonio. And <coughs> excuse me, six, since then, we've had about 600 centers uh, come on board. So um, is it perfect? Is the campus perfect? No. I, I, I look at it a lot like a family. You know what? You love your family. Do you always get along? No. Do you always agree on things? No. Do sometimes they drive you nuts? Yes. But you know you're better with them than without them. And that's kind of how I put things at the campus. I know I drive people nuts there. I know I do. I mean, and I'm okay with that. Uh, but, but we're better because we're all there together. So that's a bit of a sidebar, but you as a trade association, as memberships to the association, I think you need to know that, that the vision and the strategy is working. And this is one small example of that. Now, let's get back to this program specifically, because those of you that have been in the industry any amount of time, you realize that teaching people to bowl in a learnable format is really nothing new. Okay, some of you that are new to the industry, you may hear it today saying, wow, that is cool. Why didn't we do that, you know, 10 years ago? Well, we did. Uh, and and I'm, a per, I'm, a, I'm pretty old. I've been around a long time, got a few sunsets on me. Some of you may remember the old Duquesne projectors, remember? And you used to take this thing called a crisscross directory. And you would call from that and you'd call houses and neighborhoods. And you'd call, and if anyone answered the phone during the day, it was a stay-at-home mom, and you invited her out for what? The four-week Learn to Bowl program, didn't you? It's how our industry 35 years ago and 40 years ago, how we started daytime ladies' leagues. That's how they started. We pulled out a crisscross directory. We called people in our market areas. We invited them to a four-week program. On week five, they started a new league. They just didn't know it. That's all right. Fine. We're fine. So that, that's, how it all, that's how it all started. And many people made very successful livings out of that, you know, and starting with daytime ladies. So what we've tried to do is take that program that was very, very successful and change it for today's technology, for today's guest, 
and most importantly for today's operator and for today's proprietor. So this methodology that we're using is nothing new. It's proven. I wish we could say that uh, we, we invented something new for you. You know, I, I freely admit when, when Steve Johnson was interviewing for me this job two and a half years ago, I said, Steve, something you got to know. I, I haven't had an original thought since the sixth grade. Okay, that's not what I do. But I've been very blessed and fortunate to take a lot of people's ideas and tweak them and, and, and make them our own. And that's what you do as proprietors. You're junkyard dogs, right? You do that. You take other people's ideas, you make them your own, and that's the beauty of it. You know, we're not, we're not trying to, to cure cancer here. We're trying to engage people in a lifetime activity and get them excited about bowling. So the program is not new in and of itself. So I just want to make sure newbies, if you're new to the industry, um, just so you kind of get a benchmark of, of where it came from. So that's the background. That's kind of how it, how it started. I want you to know what it is. And from there, hopefully, it'll, it'll all make sense. So if you were in the general session, on uh, Monday, you saw our president, Kathy DeSocio, you know, go through her example to say that, you know, we don't have any bowlers in a box. You know, uh, as proprietors, we often want that quick solution and we want things to be fixed and we want bowlers in a box. And, and there are no bowlers in a box, but I'll tell you, this is about as close as you can get. Okay, this is the bowling 2.0 kit. And I want to take a minute and show you what's in the kit because I think it's important uh, for us to get started. So first thing in your kit, you'll find that there is a three foot by six foot vinyl banner. There also is a 22 by 28 uh, poster that, that's in there as well. We have developed a uh, proprietor's guide. This is a guide for the proprietor, the owner operator that walks them through the entire program, gives them a little uh, background on what we're doing and why. There is a coach's guide. The coach's guide is just that, specifically developed for the, for the person that's going to be responsible for facilitating the program. And we're going to spend some more, more time on this. There are samples of each of the uh, POS material that is available for you. These happen to be 8.5 by 11 flyers. And um, they are, these are just samples, but I'll tell you in a second where you go so you can customize this with your center information. You can put in your, your program information. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we have a big group in here today, and I've got a short amount of time, but, but I'm going to get on my marketing soapbox just for, for a moment, because I, I can. Um, and, and that is, just as an industry, something I, I think we're coming to the realization, and I try to teach too when we have our, our management school, is, you know, as an industry, why do we use 8.5 by 11 flyers? Anyone have an idea? Throw some. Why, why do we use 8.5 by 11 flyers? I'm sorry? Did someone say it's copier size? You're a genius. That's why. It's the copier size. It's not because someone statistically said, well, Bart, if you use 8.5 by 11, you can get your message on there bigger and you'll get better viewership. No, it's what fit in the damn copier. Okay, it's really what it is. I'm sorry, ladies. And, and you know what? Ten years ago, that worked for us. So I, I throw that at, and not, not poking fun at anybody, but it's just technology and cost and things of that nature. It forced us to use these. But we live in a different world now. Now, we put these in here for you because I, we didn't want to get you, have you have total withdrawals. But we, we put these in here for you to use. But, but I will tell you that uh, there are things in today's marketplace with technology and cost that have come down substantially that now you can use. We put a sample of what I call a third page flyer or a rack card. You might see this when you go to hotels or other places. And this is uh, available for you to customize and, and use on your own there. So we put that sample in there. And, and my hope is that... <laughs> Excuse me. As you start to see um, some of the different venues that are opening today in our, our market space, uh, they're starting to use these. And, and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings in, in the centers there, because I know um, my question I, I always pose folks when they push back on this is, where do you go today yourself to do business and you see that business that uses 8.5 by 11s to market? And the answer is no one. Think about when you go to Chuck E. Cheese or Dave & Buster's or a hotel or one of a business you frequent. Nobody's using these anymore to market. They just aren't. It's past that. And, and again, now we're providing you the tools. If you've got a six-lane center and have to go to the library to get access to a computer, you can, use, you can still use the third-page flyers and, and customize them yourself and make them. Okay? It's, just, it's there for you. So I'll, I'll get off the soapbox. Um, the other item is, and I passed that around, I know we had a few folks come in late, I apologize, but we put in some um, what I call 5 by 7 table tents. 
I think this is a great takeaway that we can take from the restaurant industry. And those of you that come with, from, uh, to us via the, the entertainment of the restaurant industry, you get this already. As bowling folks, we've been slow to adapt. But these are, are very nice. Again, prices have come down such that these acrylic holders, you can buy these for less than $2.50 each. And this is a very nice professional presentation. Okay. One last thing. I told you I was going to have my soapbox, but one, one last ding on my 85 ball M5. I understand I'm poking fun at myself because I made these for 20 years. Um, in fact, we started out making them by hand because we didn't have a copier. But the reality is these 85 by 11s in our centers, who uses these? Kids. Kids are the league bowlers, don't they? Yeah, the color on them. And then we got really smart. What did we start doing? We'll screw them. We'll print on the back. <laughs> they won't use them. That's how smart we got. We said, we'll just, we'll just start printing on the back. That'll stop them. So th these just, they're, they're not, you know, it's time to move on. They're not user friendly. But I didn't want to put you in convulsions. So we got some of these on here for you. Eventually, when you start drinking the Kool-Aid and, and you come along, we'll, we'll work on these together. But this is, if you go to any restaurant, if you go to an Outback or an uh, Olive Garden or go eat anywhere, you're going to see these kind of POS, these kind of table tents. And there are things that a few years ago we couldn't afford to do, but now every business operator, every bowling center operator in America can afford to do this now because the price has come down such. And technology is such that, you know, it can be formatted for you. Now, back to the kit. In the kit are weekly lesson handouts. And most of you should have these. I, I did one for, for lesson one for you. I apologize. We had a few that didn't get it. But the committee, that, the project team that put this together, um, felt that it was important to have a takeaway for the student. So this is the piece that the student receives when they complete the lessons. And we're going to go through a lesson today. You're going to experience lesson one, and I'm going to be your teacher. Now, this is going to be the biggest bowling 2.0 class I've ever done, but this is going to be lesson one. We're going to, we're going to work through it there. So in, your, in the kit, we've packaged 50, enough for your first 50 students that are, are for each of the lessons. So there's 50 for lesson one, lesson two, Lesson three and lesson four, those are, are in there for you as well. But the secret sauce, the, the, really the thing that sets it apart, is the video lessons. And there are uh, four video lessons designed to coincide with each of the weeks. And each of those lessons are, you know, 12 to 15 minutes. And we'll talk a little bit when I walk you through how that works. Uh, but this is really kind of the, the, the secret sauce that, that goes with it there, okay? Because one of the biggest obstacles as operators we have is who's going to teach this? How do I find coaches? You know, how do I work with my pro shop? You know, uh, those are the questions that go through your mind. It's probably on, on the way in, you probably said, boy, I like the idea of teaching people to bowl, but who's going to do it? Okay, so this is really the secret sauce. And this is what we'll walk through because this allows somebody like me to host a program and, and not have to be a, a world-class coach. Okay, and we'll share some We'll share some examples of that. Now, in today's environment, um, lost my clicker there. <coughs> Excuse me. In today's environment, we live in a digital age. So we need to provide you things over and above just the normal printed material. Those are good and those are fine, but we need, we need more. So we provided some digital elements. There is a email template. Hopefully all of you are email marketing. Okay, if not, you should be. It's very affordable now as business operators. We have an email template in there for you. There's a website ad. We formatted that uh, two or three different ways uh, that you can put that on your, on your website. Uh, some of you may host your websites with us, BPAA. If not, uh, whoever does your website should be able to put that on there for you. And we also developed a 30-second <coughs> promotional spot that is designed to be used in social media. You can put it on your Facebook. You can use it with Twitter. Uh, you know, you can send it out a link with email. And a lot of folks put it on their website. So you can put it on your website as well. And I'm going to show you, well, first I'm going to show you the banner ad. Then I'm going to show you that 30-second that spot there just because I want you to see it. I want you to see the quality and just kind of how it would look and think about your particular website. So this is the banner ad. Again, we formatted that. That could be on a website in uh, two or three different uh, formats. And then this is the uh, actual... It's as easy as one, two, three, four. And this opposite arm helps maintain balance for the whole body. Introducing Bowling 2.0, where in just four weeks you can be bowling better and having a lot more fun doing it. <laughs> Whether you're brand new to the sport or just want to learn more of the fundamentals, Bowling 2.0 is here to help. 
You now have access to some of the best coaches in the world with video lessons sure to improve your game. I'm going to show you the proper way to do it. Give us four weeks and we'll give you your new favorite pastime. Join the Bowling 2.0 movement. Classes are now forming right here. Sign up today. So you can see that's a very quick, fast-paced promotional spot. It's very generic and can be used for any bowling center in, in America or any 10-pin center around the world for that matter. Uh, you know, because it's just very, very generic. It doesn't give a center specific. It doesn't give anything about cost or free. It just talks about the program in itself. And if my uh, technology is working here, I just want to show you real quick one of our test centers. This is actually, I'm on the, on the web here on the uh, uh, Wi-Fi here at the hotel. This is Easton Bowl in uh, Easton, Maryland. I don't know if Kathleen's with us today. Uh, 24 lane center in a small town outside of uh, Baltimore. And she hosts her website with us. So I just wanted you to see what that looks like. And then right on her homepage here, she's put that on there. It's as easy as one, two, three, four. And this opposite arm helps maintain balance for the whole body. Introducing Bowling 2.0, where in just four weeks you can be bowling better and having a lot more fun doing it. Whether you're brand new to the sport or just want to learn more of the fundamentals, Bowling 2.0 is here to help. You now have access to some of the best coaches in the world with video lessons sure to improve your game. I'm going to show you the proper way to do it. Give us four weeks and we'll give you your new favorite pastime. Join the Bowling 2.0 movement. Classes are now forming right here. And, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm going to apologize. I, this, my allergies here in the desert have got me, so I apologize in advance for the coughing there, but we'll get through it. So um, one of the key decision points now about the kid, and the reason I spend so much time on this, it's critical for us when we talk about program development because what do we want to be for you as an association and what expectations do you have for us? You know, we, we've given you the tools to get started in, in the kit, but where do you go from there? How do you customize your own stuff? Where do you get the, the, the electronic stuff? Where, where does it reside? You know, and what we decided was, as the project team, is we didn't want to be in the kit business. And we didn't want to be in the fulfillment business and the print business. It's not a good use of your resources and funds. And quite honestly, it's not a good use of our time and, and space. So what we did with this is we took everything that, you, that I went through and showed you both in the physical kit and in the digital space, and we put this for you on the, on the website. So hopefully you're familiar and have uh, tooled around a little bit on the BPA website. But if you're not, there's a page on the right there that says my BPA, or left on mybpa.com. If you click on that, it takes you to a secure page. It's semi-secure. I mean, we just don't want random surfers you know, out on the web finding us, not that there's sensitive information. But when you click on that, it'll ask for a username and a password. Your username is your member number. So you'll need to have that to log in. The password is the same for everybody. It's BPAA. So member number. BPAA, that gets you into behind the wall so you can get into the, to the system now. Then when you click on that, this is what you'll see come up, the Boeing 2.0 banner. And then when you click on that banner, you'll see a whole array of file folders that has all of the items that I showed you. So you can go back then and use them any way you want. So once we get you started with the kit, you know, the kit was designed to be enough to get you up and going for your first 50 students. Then you're on your own. You're on your own to decide the level of print quality. You may want to print it in-house. You may want to print it in-house, take it outside to be cut. You may want to take it completely outside. That's your decision. Your business operators, you make your own marketing decisions on what level of, of POS that you want to develop. Yes? D oh, question was, password, is it case sensitive? The answer is no. It can be, thank you, good question, thank you. Uh, it can be upper or lower case, just to get you on the system there, uh, on there. And that, what that does is that takes you to all the files. Some of you, we got a whole array of different types of centers here. Some of you are large centers. One three by six banner isn't gonna make a very big imprint or impact on your bowling center, is it? You might need three or four banners. There's a high res print ready art file that you could take to a printer to go get other banners made. Let's say that you, 
like posters. I know posters are a big deal for some. I love posters. I think they're a great way to, to promote your business. One poster may not be enough for you. You can take that, that print-ready art file, that 22 by 28 poster, and you can go get as many as you want made up. The same with the other items. So what we're doing is giving you the tools so you don't have to pay for the development. They're there. And then you take the files that you'd like to get them printed somewhere because none of us have the capability to print posters and banners and those type of things. Or you do in-house the things that you'd like to do in, in customizing your program. Also, that video that I showed you, the promotion video, that's on there with the instructions on how to, how to uh, program that in your website. It's fairly easy. Again, if you have a BPA site, it's something that our team can do for you. If not, the person who does your website should be able to do that for you. Uh, so digital, electronic, print, all of that is on there for you. Because we want you to be self-sufficient once you're up and going, with the exception of one thing. The only thing that's not on there is the video lessons. Because we really just don't want those floating around. And quite honestly, you as members before to, you know, today can go grab all of this. You can go download all of this and get started without giving BPA a penny. You could do that. But what you don't have is the secret sauce. Okay? So um, in the unlikely event you lose the video and, and you call us for another video, we're going to send you just a whole other kit. Okay? Uh, and, and, and normally, and I've been presented at BPA e even here before I started with the team for many, many years, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is not here to sell people th things, but this is a, a member benefit for you. So I'm here to sell you something, but it's for your own good. The kit is, I'm going to come right to you, Ralph. <clears throat> the cost on the kit is $49. Okay? So th I don't think you can go out and buy a 3 by 6 banner for $49. Okay? So it's not a revenue-producing stream for the, for the association. At best, it's going to be net neutral. In fact, we'll probably lose a few shekels. But we, we, you know, the goal is not to make money. It's not a revenue source. So the kit in itself for all of those items is $49. That gets you up and going for your first 50 students. All right? And then I'm going to come back and talk about this a little more there. Ralph, did you have a question, sir? Uh, we'd have to have an offline discussion about that. It's a little deeper discussion. I think the methodology is good, but we'd have to have a talk because I know the, the duck pin folks have had some inquiries and some five pin folks. So, <coughs> excuse me, we'd have to have to think through that. But it's important here. You know, we haven't taught you anything yet, but it's important. I want you to understand where these items reside, where you go to get them going forward, and from a just a tactical thing, what you need to you know your materials. So everybody's good on where they get their materials. I want to make sure you're clear on that, because I get a couple calls a week, someone saying, well, Bart, I, where was this? You know, and I'm going to send you right here. You know, here's where it all resides. So this is where the, nut, this is where the meat is, is, is here for you. So this takes BPA out of the print business, takes us out of the fulfillment business. Now we can get into the solution business and, and trying to help you. So let's, let's move on. I want to get past that. That's kind of the getting over the hurdle of what the heck it is and what's inside. Now let's talk about how we're going to use it. But before we get into that, let's talk about why now. <clears throat> it really is an indirect extension, extension of the league dropout research. Um, you probably know this, but there are a lot of national committees, and some of you serve on them, and there is a uh, league development committee. And we've been commissioned and doing research for the last couple of years. Last year, we spoke to focus groups of people that had dropped out of league bowling. And we did that in eight groups in four cities around the United States. And while nobody said to us during those, and they were run by professional moderators, a professional research firm, not by, you know, like Bart and Bart. Uh, but we were sitting behind the mirror and, and watching all of them. And while nobody came out of those sessions and said, hey, Bart, if you would have taught me to bowl better in four weeks, I wouldn't have quit. They did make comments about their, uh, their skill level uh, and their discouragement and uh, coaching or lack thereof. So they made some indirect comments, which kind of got us thinking, is it time to bring this back? Is it time to resurrect this and, and do it with today's technology? Uh, so it really was a project that was launched by the League Development Committee. Dave Barden is the, our chair of that from uh, Wisconsin. And that's the group that really took the project with the support of USBC and Strike 10 and, and, and really brought it to market. And for me, most importantly, it fills a void. The last time this program was done in, in this uh, manner was 1990. You may remember a program called The Special Sport with Fred Borden and the gentleman that used to do the uh, ladies' pro tour, uh, Denny Schreiner. So they were the last two that put a program like this together. 
And before that, it goes back to my old Duquesne days. You know, we had it on the old projector there. So, you know, one of the questions that, that Steve posed when he shared our strategic direction with you yesterday at our membership meeting is, you know, we don't want to bring a product to market if it doesn't fill a need. Does it fill a need, and is it something that you can go out and do on your own? And, and look, you all are beautiful people, but you can't go out and do this on your own. Not, not with the video. You can go out and teach it on your own. Some of you do a great job with it. But you can't put together this kind of a package with this, this type of material. And not even the two big boys can go do the video shoot like this, because that's, that's not cheap. Be, they have to invest a lot of money that, that would be hard to justify the, the ROI. So it does fill a void, which for me was, was, was critical as, as we move forward. So let's take a journey just for a second and talk about the life cycle of the bowler, if, if we want to understand our target market here. Now, this is not really any research. This is kind of the world according to Bart. So you may not agree, but just kind of stay with me here for 30 seconds, and it'll help us, help us move on. All of us in this room fall somewhere in the life cycle of a bowler, even those of us that are in the industry. We're somewhere between a non-bowler, some of us may not be active now, to an avid league bowler. Okay? Just very quickly, I'll tell you that a casual bowler, I define that as the person that visits your center two to four times a year when it rains on Thanksgiving, when they're there for the Junior Achievement Fundraiser. I mean, you know who they are. You know, they're the person that when you, you know, they, you tell them you're on lane 11, they say, where's that? You know, and our awesome counter person says, well, right next to 12, you know, so, because <laughs> we're great at that customer service stuff, too. So, you know that casual bowler, you kind of, you get, you get my target there. Then there's that casual frequent bowler. That's the person that uh, is very reliable. I mean, you, you know them as the person that comes into your Friday night or Saturday night moonlight program or your glow program, and they're there three out of four weeks, but you can't get them to take the next step. Right? You know those folks that they come in, they're regular, but you can't get them to commit to the, the league or do the L word, but they're pretty reliable to you. They're a good revenue stream. And then we cross over this new league bowler. You know these folks. God bless them. They, they're the 8 for 8 folks. They're the folks that we mi mix in with our uh, hardcore bowlers and, and chase them away every year. You, you know who those people are. <clears throat> and then there's the avid league bowler. And I used to be one, so I can poke fun at myself. These are the folks that are 5% of your revenue and 95% of your headaches. They're your prima donnas. And every person, just a name popped in your mind right now, didn't it? Yeah, because I, I had them too. Okay. So anyway, that's just kind of a baseline. You may or may not agree with the definitions, but that's just my little baseline of, of kind of the, the, the life cycle of a bowler. Here's what we know. We know there's about 2 million league bowlers out there in America right now. Best we can tell, about 2 million. This is in, in, North, in the United States. <coughs> we know from external research, this has been proven by a third party, not by, by bowling, that there are about 70 million people that identify themselves in America as bowling once in the last 12 months. So when you hear the industry talk about bowling being the largest participation sport in America, that's where that data comes from. I don't know if you know this or not, but you should feel pretty darn good about the industry and, and the sport you're a part of. More people bowl every year than play golf, tennis, soccer, lacrosse, baseball, basketball, keep naming sports and, and none of them will top it. More people bowl in America than any of those other activities, period. We have the largest participation sport in, in, in America. Okay? So just, just know that. You should feel pretty good about that. But there's 70 million of those critters out there that, that fall into to that bucket. Now, if I take out all of the people in America left under the age of four, and I take out all the people that have less than 25,000 in household income, and, and just make the assumption that they're not targets for me because they can't afford my product, they're, they're near poverty, then that leaves me with a bucket of 200 million people that don't bowl. That's the person I want to go after with this program. Okay? <clears throat> We've got a lot of great programs for these 2 million. You're going to learn a lot about them here this week. You probably already have. Okay? I love those folks. I want them to get better. I want them to not, not quit and continue on. But that's not what I'm doing with this program. It's not for them. <clears throat> now, I love these 70 million. I'm glad that they, they participate. And yeah, maybe I can feed some of them into my program if they're those casual folks that come once every six months or, or once or twice a year. I'm okay with that. But that's not my real target. If I'm going to move the needle in my market, in the industry, and, and really fight this thing with Lee Bowling and prove that it's not dead, here's my market, 200 million. That's what I'm going after with this program. And as we developed this program, it was with that group in mind that we built this around. Now. You can do the same analogy for your marketplace. As a member benefit, all of our domestic centers could pull a, a, a demographic profile. I hope you did. And in that demographic profile, you could do this same study and say, hey, so 
and, and I'm not living in some fantasy world. I'm not saying that we're going to get half of those hundred million in the bowl. We, we're just that's just you know ludicrous. But what's what's five percent of that worth to the industry? What's two percent of that worth to the industry? What's what's one percent of that? Yeah, what's that worth? What's half a percent worth to us? So you can do the same in your marketplace. And all of you have big markets, small markets, medium markets. What, what if you got 5,000 potential bowlers in your marketplace? What's it worth if 2% come see you? You know, it's got to be worth something. So you can do the math. But I, I wanted to take a minute and share this because I want you to understand the target. Now, I know this because I know you, I think like you, and some of you already called me and told me about it. You're going to be tempted to, to open this up to your league bowlers and say, and then call me and ask for forgiveness. Because they call him Bart. It's okay, I did that. It's, look, it's your business. But if you want to know the best practice, no, fight the urge. Don't do it. You're going to be, you're going to be it's going to happen. But I'm just telling you, to, to, this is the pay dirt. This is where we want to grow to. Now, we need to talk a little bit about where we find those people and how we get them in. So we'll... we'll it's a much deeper discussion than we have for today, but I at least want to scratch it a little bit so I leave you with, leave you with something. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, let's talk about the program. And I'm going to put this first line up here, and half of you are going to tune out. And, and that is that it's designed to be a four-week free program. Now, we could go get a case of beer and a couple of bottles. Of, well, we need more than a couple of bottles with this group. But, I mean, a case of beer and a whole bunch of wine. <coughs> Excuse me. And we could have a philosophical discussion on free versus paid, and I think each of us can make a pretty good case on why we're right. <clears throat> okay? So I'm not here today to debate with you about free versus paid philosophically as an industry. What I want to do is share with you kind of the methodology of how we develop this program, and then understand at the end of the day, you're going to do your own thing, and we're okay with that. And we had a lot of time on this. The, the, the committee and the planning group spent a lot of time on this. <clears throat> you will notice. If you look at the green 5x7 I handed you, and, and you'll notice on any of the PO, none of the POS makes any reference to price or free. It's all generic. So we're not forcing anybody to do it either way. We realize that you're small business owners, you own, you, you know, it's your sweat equity, it's your blood, sweat, and tears. At the end of the day, you're going to do the, 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 whatever works best for you, and, and we respect that. Now, I'll, I'll try to speak to and share with you best practices on what works best, but at the end of the day, you do what's best for you, and we, we respect that, okay? Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and hoping it makes sense why we're, we're, we're advocating it as a, as a, as a free program, because it's really not free. It's really a, a, a marketing investment. It, it's, not, it's not free. But to the, to the guest, it's designed to be a four-week free program, okay? Each week is designed to be an hour and a half long, it's designed to be 30 minutes in the classroom and about an hour on the lanes. Now, let me share with you some best practices that have come up around, around the country here. Um, it is very important, if you can, to put them in a classroom. And you're going to have to define what classroom means because all of your physical plants are so different. Okay? Classroom might be in a bar, might be a, a meeting room, it might be, you know, uh, wherever. It, it, it's going to mean different things to different folks. But know this, from the guest experience, that student that you have in there, they have better retention and their overall satisfaction is higher if they're in a classroom setting. There's just something about getting them in this classroom setting, learning, you know, what it is you're going to do, and then going to a different location and putting it into practice. Okay, there's, a method, there's a teaching methodology there, and you just have to trust us on that. Now, if your physical plant just doesn't permit it, you may be forced to just say, Bart, the best I can do is I've got to put it on the overheads, and that's all I can do. And, and that's not the end of the world. But it, I'm just saying, if you have the option, don't take the shortcut. Find a space. Find a space with a TV or a VCR or you know, something that you can you get your coach in there and, and teach, because we know that their satisfaction is better if they can get in the classroom. So that's a tidbit I'll share with you. Use the classroom when you can. Um, the other thing is, here's another thing you're going to be tempted to. You're going to want to go longer than an hour and a half. Okay, because they're having fun. They're having a good time. An hour and a half's not a long time. Fight the urge. Don't do it. Leave them wanting more. Leave them wanting more. <clears throat> Don't leave them tired after two hours. Leave them wanting more after an hour and a half. Because here's what we found. Some of them started to come in and actually practice. Imagine that, new bowlers practicing, and get, they're paying. 
Okay, so we have new people practicing and paying without free coupons. All right, so it, 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 it works. So it's, you're going to be tempted. Your coach, and I don't, we may have some coaches in here, and I'm apologizing in advance because I'm going to offend a couple of coaches, and I don't want to do that. Well, I love you, but I just blanket, I'm just blanket forgiveness for my, my coaching friends out there. Um, the coach is going to come to you and say, they're having a great time. This hour and a half is not enough. I can't even teach them all I want to teach them. You know, let's go two hours. Why aren't we doing two hours? <clears throat> Leave them wanting more. You know, fight, fight the urge. In this, in this hour and a half, I don't have time to share with you all the data, but leave them wanting more. Hour and a half is a great time. It works. And on there. Now, <clears throat> these are approximates. Don't get caught up. And I had one center call me and say, Bart, I don't know what to do. I can only get 20 minutes in the classroom. What do I do? I bowl for an hour and 10 minutes. You know, these are just guidelines. These are just to get you thinking because people usually say, well, Bart, where do I start? What do I do? So it's designed to be 30 minutes in that classroom. Now, what, what we'll do is you show that video and then what you're doing is you're speaking to and reinforcing what's in the video. And, that, and we'll do that in just a second. Okay, so you're not looking to fill 30 minutes. And that's the secret sauce that allows folks like myself to facilitate it versus having to have a caliber of a, of a silver or a bronze you know, level coach. Okay? Now, this is key. This is the key. Week five is the start of your rollover program. Okay? If you are strategically not going to start a league or a club or whatever you want to call it, I just, I just brand it as a rollover program, and we'll talk a little bit about what some options of that, that are, and many of you are doing some great things already. If you're not going to start a program in week five, then don't give it away for free. Just charge them, call it what it is, and make a few shekels off the lessons. Okay? If you're not going to start a program in week five, and you're not in this to start new league bowlers, then it's not a bad thing to teach people to bowl in four weeks. There's no, nothing wrong with that, but it's not the design of the program. So I support the free positioning if I'm going to start a program on week five. Just doing free lessons to do free lessons is just like giving away a free game that's good any time with no restrictions. makes no sense to me. Okay? So you've got to be thinking about what I'm going to start on, on week five, what that, what that program is. Because that's where the magic comes in. That's where I get these people to, to convert over. And, and I get them to join one of my, my programs. Uh, because I'm in this, this program, I'm in this to generate new league bowlers. I mean, I'd love to teach some people to bowl. I, I believe that if people learn our sport, they'll have a greater propensity to, to participate more than if they, they don't know our sport. But this whole thing is about, on week five, <coughs> excuse me, starting the magic. And, and this is where, um, and I gotta be careful, this is where I offend some of my coaching friends, and, and our test, God bless the test, it, it showed us this, and that is that a good proprietor with a little bit of bowling knowledge will outperform a great coach with a little bit of business knowledge in this program every time. Let me say that again and, and explain to you why. A good businessman or woman, a good proprietor with a little bit of business knowledge will outperform a world-class coach with a little bit of business knowledge every single time. And here's why. Because as business operators, you're starting with the end in mind. Okay? And the end is that new league or that new club. Where a coach thinks through a diff they look through a different lens and they think differently. They're talking about the, the person's experience, the student's experience. They don't think about when they're going to hold it and whether or not a league's going to start. It doesn't make them a bad person. It's just not, th not the lens that they look through. So the question that you have to ask yourself about this program is not when do I want to run a bowling 2.0. The question for you is when do I want to start a new league? Because if you ask me, Bart, when do you think I should run a bowling 2.0? When's the best time? I'll say, when do you want to start a new league? When do you have lane availability? What lanes are you trying to fill? Because that's the answer to your question. Now, a coach thinks differently. A coach says, well, when do I think I can get the most people? You know, when's a good time for me? My schedule does Saturday morning, you know. And that's not bad when you're talking about traditional lessons. <clears throat> but this is about non-users, sampling, converting. So the first question you ask yourself in this planning stage is, when do I want new league bowlers? When do I want a new club? not when do I want a 2.0. So I'm starting with the end in mind. And, and as operators, you get this, okay? You, you, you get that part. Um, and and it, it bore out in our test. 
It bore out in our test. One of the centers I'll share with you in, in a few minutes uh, had phenomenal results, and we'll walk through why. And another center that was taught by a world-class coach that's a wonderful person, wonderful person, failed. And it failed for that very reason. They didn't start with that first question. And that was not, when do I want to do a 2.0? It's when do I want to start a, a, a new league, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We are going to make sure my remote's working. You now are going to get a chance to go through Bowling 2.0 as a student. I am going to take you through lesson one. And hopefully after you see lesson one, it will make sense why somebody like myself can teach this versus uh, having to have somebody that's a, a bronze or a silver level coach, okay? Uh, this first lesson is about 14 minutes, and I've given you the handout that goes along with that, and you're in, you're in my classroom, okay? This is just like a class, that's a big classroom. It's a lot of you, I need a lot of coaches, but this is, this is my classroom here. But I want you to see the, uh, the quality of the video and the, and the teaching points and kind of the methodology. And what I'm gonna look for and, and ask all of you when we're done is, I'm going to ask you what you liked about it, but then I also want you to tell me what you didn't like about it, okay? Th th so nitpick it. Tell me what you liked, tell me what you didn't like. So this is lesson one. Hello, and welcome to Bowling 2.0, where better bowling is only four weeks away. I'm Bart Berger with the Bowling Proprietors Association of America. Welcome. Regardless if you're a new bowler, haven't been bowling for some time, or an occasional bowler just wanting to learn the basics and improve your game, you are in the right spot. You're about to join the bowling movement and be part of America's largest participation sport. That's right, over 70 million Americans bowl each year, making bowling the largest participation sport in the United States. We're here at the International Bowling Campus in Arlington, Texas, inside the ITRC, the International Training and Research Center, where members of our coaching staff will be joining you each week along with the coach at your participating bowling center to share with you everything you need to know about making bowling a lifetime sport. Joining us today to get things started is Carolyn Doran Ballard, who's truly one of the best female bowlers of all time. She's won 22 professional titles, been named Bowler of the Decade, and is a USBC Hall of Fame member. Welcome, Carolyn. Thanks, Bart. Hey, we are ready to rock and roll. Bowlers, let me tell you what you're going to learn over the next four weeks. Besides having fun, you're going to learn the fundamentals of bowling. You're going to learn how to make those spares, you know, the pins that you always leave and you don't know where to stand to make them. You're going to learn about how to have a loose arm swing so that you strike more often. And you're going to learn about bowling etiquette and even how to get your own equipment if you feel you want to get your own ball and your own shoes. We are ready to have you have a lot of fun out there on the lanes. Excellent. Thank you, Carolyn. You're in great hands with Carolyn and the coaching team here. You're also in great hands with the coach at your local bowling center. So, hey, let's get started. And remember, most importantly, let's have some fun. Before you get started getting on the approach and rolling your ball down the lane, you're going to have to go to the control counter or the front desk and get a pair of rental shoes. Just want to give you a little bit of a safety tip. These shoes, this part here, needs to stay dry. You don't want any powder. You don't want this part getting wet. Because what that does is it does not allow the shoe to slide on the approach and allow you to perform your approach and get good leverage into the line. So be careful when you're in the, in the bowler's settee area and make sure that there aren't any drinks on the floor or any powder that can get on the shoe and inhibit your approach. Before we get you out on the approach and on that lane to throw the ball, we're going to learn a little bit about where to line up and what these markings are on the approach and on the lane and how they can help you be a better bowler and enjoy the sport. There are two sets of dots on the approach. These dots are used for when you're trying to line up to hit the head pin, which is also referred to as the pocket. You might be standing in the middle of the lane, you may have to move a little to the right, you may have to move a little to the left. Using these dots on the approach will help you remember where your strike target is and where your spare shot is. As we move up the approach, there's another set of dots right in front of the foul line. These dots are also used for getting lined up and for targeting purposes. Now, one important factor, this foul line. Do not cross over the foul line. That nasty buzz means you're going to get zero for the frame. Not only that, you don't want to cross the foul line because remember, there's conditioner on the lanes and you don't want to slip. 
We have stripped this lane so that I can show you how to target and what is on the lane that you can look at. As we go down the lane, there's another set of dots that people use for targeting for both your strike shot and your spare shooting. As we get further down the lane, there's a set of arrows, which is almost to the middle part of this lane that's pretty far down there. So usually the dots or the arrows is where most people target to make it easy for them to see. If you want to target further down the lane, we have range finders way down here. And you can also use this for your strike or your spare shot. Now, one of the other keys you can use, especially since you are a new bowler, is a lot of people like to look at the pins when they're trying to knock them down. This is okay too. Targeting is a personal preference and we have just given you a lot of options. Hi everyone, my name is Herman Glenn. I'm the Director of Equipment Specifications and Certifications here at USBC. Today I'd like to show you some of the different types of lane material you'll be bowling on. First off, we have wood. This is the oldest surface in what some centers still have today. It's the softest and gives you the most curve to your ball. As time went on with maintenance issues and the lane started wearing out, they went to lane shield, which actually was applied to this surface. And after that comes the synthetic lanes, which you'll see more today in most of the centers that you go to. Now that we're inside the bowling center and getting ready to bowl, we have to find a ball that fits us. Sometimes they're a little too heavy, sometimes they're a little light, and the finger holes and thumb hole really never fit. What do these bowling balls do for us? These bowling balls are house balls. They're designed just to be recreational play. They're plastic bowling balls. They're going to go straight down the lane. They're not going to react like the, the high-end performance stuff you may see. The, the holes are important to understand that they basically just plug in a basic fit, a small, a medium, and a large size. So you don't get a custom fit that may be a little too big, like you mentioned, maybe a little too small, but ultimately you want to find one that's close and comfortable just so that you can get the ball off your hand comfortably. Well, we have a few tips that will help you pick out a ball that's comfortable for you to use. Okay, you've got your lane. It's time to choose the correct bowling ball. Two important things to remember here. Number one, you want to make sure you get a bowling ball that's approximately 10% of your body weight to begin with. So if you're 100 pounds, a 10 pound ball. If you're 140 pounds, a 14 pound ball. The center is going to have multiple choices for you to choose from. The second thing is the importance of the fit. When you put your hand inside the bowling ball, you want to make sure the fingers fit comfortably. Not too big and not too small so that you can hold on to the ball, but just in that comfortable position so it's easy for you to release the ball when you're going through your approach. How do you place your hand in the ball? I'm going to show you the proper way to do it. If you're using a house ball, you want to make sure you pick it up from the sides. What we're going to do today is we're going to place our fingers into the second joint and then roll the ball onto our thumb all the way so it sits all the way onto your thumb. This is a good way to grip a house ball or a conventional fit. If you have your own custom bowling ball, you might be able to go up and wait because it's going to be a perfect fit for your hand. This is a fingertip grip. This time only my fingertips are going to go in first to the first joint and then I'm going to roll it all the way onto my thumb. This helps if you want to learn how to hook the ball. You've got a lot of information on bowling balls. We're going to review the two kinds of bowling balls that you possibly can use to make your bowling experience fun. The house ball, the ball that you're going to have in the bowling center where you're getting ready for competition or just going to have fun with your friends or to bowl league. This is a plastic bowling ball or a polyester bowling ball. It's not going to hook very much. It's going to go really straight and the majority of the time this is drilled with a conventional grip. That's what also helps this ball go straight down the lane. The other bowling ball is one that you may get after week four. This ball here is a reactive bowling ball. This is what's going to give you a little bit more hook or curve into that head pin. This one is going to be drilled for your hand, custom fit. And this is the one that's going to allow you to get to the next level of bowling. Choosing that right ball can be a little difficult, but I'm going to give you one more little tip to try and make it a little more comfortable. For that house ball, pick up a lighter weight first, say 10 pounds, 10% 10 of your body weight. So if you're 100 pounds, it would be a 10 pound ball. And just put your elbow next to your side and hold that ball in your palm. 
If the ball doesn't move and it's steady, that weight is perfect for you. If it moves around a little bit and you feel that where you have to grab it, it's a little bit too heavy, go down in weight. Same thing for when you're getting that personally fitted ball. They will hold that ball in your hand to see if that weight is right for you. I know we're all here to bowl and roll the ball down the lane, but there's so much more to the sport of bowling. It's a sport, and in any sport, you have to keep yourself in shape and make sure you do the right things so that you don't get injured. What are some of the things we can do in bowling before we start to get out there? Well, it's very important because bowling is an athletic activity. You gotta make sure when you're warming up, and we've learned that you need to do dynamic warm up. Dynamic warm up simply gets the body's core warmed up and gets the blood flowing to the larger muscle groups because we're going to compete with those large muscle groups, the leg muscles, the arm muscles. So we do dynamic warm ups to begin with and then we get on the approach and, and start to bowl. So I don't want you to be embarrassed but really the bowlers area, the settee area is a great place to do a few of those before you get out there for your competition, correct? Correct. It's the right place to do it. It's right before competition. It's right when you're getting ready to, to compete or, or recreationally play. It's the right place to do it. And like any other sport, you do it right before you get ready to play. So the bowler circle is definitely the place to go compete, go warm up. Okay, here's some examples of what we can do to warm up before we bowl. Arm circles are very simple to do. We start going forward, we simply roll up the shoulders and get our arms going forward and then we go the opposite direction, we go backward. One other exercise of torso twists. With our hands in by our side, we basically just bend at the torso, back and forth. We can also do leg swings. Standing on one leg, we swing the opposite leg back and forth. We make sure and do this to both sides on each of the exercises. One of the things that also gets the body real warmed up is to do running in place. When starting your approach in bowling, the stance, your start, is the most important and you need to be comfortable. What are some of the key components, Coach Steven, to help with a good stance? Well, there's two things that are really important when it comes to the stance. Number one is balance. From the shoulders to the knees, everything being balanced over the top of the footwork in relationship to where you're holding the ball is going to be essential when it comes to starting a good approach. To go along with that is going to be posture. Making sure your posture stays the same from your start position all the way through to your finished position is very important when it comes to balancing your approach. So these key components in your start will lead you to a good finish. Every bowler is going to be a little different in finding their starting position on the approach. Teresa is going to begin by showing us how to find the appropriate start position for a basic four-step approach. She's going to walk to the foul line, place her heels on the set of dots, and she's simply going to take four and a half steps back from the foul line and once she takes her half step she'll pivot on her toe and this will be her approximate starting distance from the foul line because everybody's a little different size everyone's going to start in a little different position on the approach so it's important to make sure you understand where your starting position is go to the foul line set of dots four and a half steps back pivot on that last step turn around and that's going to be your approximate distance to start for your beginning position on the approach okay let's start with the foundation the four step approach this is the basic thing you want to know when you're getting into learning how to get the ball off your hand comfortably from start to finish. Teresa is going to help demonstrate for us. She's found a starting position that's comfortable from the foul line. She's going to begin with her balance over her feet. Her knees are slightly bent and the ball will be placed in front of her body so that she's balanced and ready to perform her shot. Her first step is going to have the bowling ball and the ball side foot move at the same time. They're going to move out at the same position. Her second step is going to be the non-ball side foot where the ball comes down by her side. The third step of her approach will have the top of her backswing and now the fourth step will be her slide and when she releases her non-ball side foot will be behind her and come behind so that it's balanced at the bottom of her, her release. It's important to be stable and have a good foundation when you finish your shot. A four-step approach will really add pins to your game. We've just learned about the four-step approach. Let's take a quick recap and understand those steps again and understand some places we may want to be careful of when we're talking about it. In the four-step approach, the first place is the stance and our balance. We want to make sure that when we start, we've got everything comfortably over our footwork. In our start position, when we move our ball side and the ball side foot at the same time for step number one, we want to make sure that that's a smooth, rounded position. We don't want to lock our arms straight out in front of us. We don't want the ball to fall too fast. We want a nice, smooth, rounded position going into that swing. Through steps two and three, we need to remember that the ball swings freely from our ball side shoulder. It swings from our shoulder nice and loose, and we try to keep a free arm swing throughout the approach. 
Now the finished position is where the big key is. We want to really nail that position and make sure we're solid. So when we get to the finished position, we make sure that we follow through all the way to our tar through our target and toward our pins. We make sure our opposite arm has good balance for our body positioning. And we make sure that once we follow through, we finish the shot with our elbow all the way over our shoulder. That's going to make sure we extend our follow through all the way toward those targets and those pins. So, take your game to the next level, take the four-step approach, and make it part of your game. It's important to look both directions when you're getting onto your approach for lane courtesy. It's very important to be safe in this environment and know that there's no one on your left and no one on your right when you step up to take your approach. Once you've stepped into your starting position and you're ready to go, you'll throw your shot. Remember to follow through toward your target. And make sure that you hold your that balance position so that you're comfortable and you execute a good shot. You've got some information about the game in regards to safety. We've talked about where to start on the approach. We've talked about the four-step approach. For any further questions about what you've learned, check your reference guide. Okay, so, so that is lesson one. And, and this would be where, uh, as your instructor, the lead instructor, or one of the coaches of the program, I would come out and spend a few minutes talking to some of the things you just saw. So I would walk you through some of those. Now, it wouldn't make sense for me to go through everything. That would be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, wouldn't be good use of time. But as a coach, I'm going to come out and, and teach you this now. So if you think about this, it really changes the dynamic of the type of person that can do this. Because if I was going to have to teach this from scratch without any aids, aid of a video, it would be a much different process, wouldn't it? I'd have to have a much different skill level. I'd have to go through all the steps that you know, those silver and bronze and gold level coaches do. And that's why I wanted to take their expertise and allow someone like myself with a little bit of knowledge to then speak to it. So it changes the dynamic. I couldn't teach this, and I've been in bowling a long time, I could not teach this and feel good about the product I would deliver without the aid of the video. I couldn't do it, I'm just not that good. But I can reinforce the things that these people that are the best coaches in the world, what they're speaking to and what they're teaching. So we'll spend a few minutes, that was like 14 minutes and 30 seconds, we then would spend a few minutes talking about answering questions, reinforcing things that I think are important for you to know, and now we're gonna go out and hit the lanes. Okay, and that's where we're gonna go out and put things into practice. So um, the piece that I gave you, and borrow yours here, Ray, this is actually designed to be given away at the end of the session as their take home, but I wanted you to see it because I wanted you to see kind of the quality. What we found is if you give this to them in advance, it gets a little overwhelming. You know, it's like, where do I start? And then they're looking at this while they're looking at the video, they're not paying attention. I just wanted you to have this in advance, but I will just tell you just kind of as a um, best practice, I would encourage you to make this the handout when the student finishes week one. So if you think about the learning methodology that we've used here, we, we show them, we tell them, and then we go out and let them try, and then we give them this takeaway to kind of reinforce. And that's a pretty good learning model if you have any educators out there. So we're, we're telling them, we tell them through the video, which is where we get the professional help because I can't do it. We're sh showing them, we're talking through it, which I can do with the aid of, aid of the video. Then I'm going to go out and let them try it, and then I'm going to give them this as their little takeaway. It might end up on the fridge, it might end up something they talk about, you know, they might bring it in while they're practicing, I, I don't know. But that's at least the, the, the learning model that, that went into this. Now, tell me what, what you liked or what you didn't like. What didn't you like or like about the video? And you can't hurt my feelings. I'm married with children. Go ahead, sir. Okay, so you felt it was, it was a, a lot to do, a little intimidating, overwhelming, okay, could be, way too much, appreciate that. Who else? What do you got? What do you like, what do you didn't like? Shout it out. You didn't like her sitting on the ball return, okay, got that? Yes, ma'am, Karen. Yes, that's, yeah, there's a little edit there. So, yeah, the, 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 there were a couple of, well, you'll, if you watch the whole thing, you'll find a couple of them. Yeah, you'll find a couple. So there are a few tweaks in there. Peter. Are you really going to make the exercise? Ah, the exercise. Thanks for bringing that up. Are you really going to do that? Really do that? Uh, <coughs> good, good feedback, good question. Here, here's what I said, Peter, because that comes up every time. I, I had a couple of guys that said, Bart, you think our league bowlers are going to do that? I said, no, they won't. Now, you as people in the industry, if I took traditional league bowlers and I got them out there and said, okay, everybody, here we're going to do arm circles, you're going to look at me just like that. It's not going to be pretty. However, 
I will tell you that, uh, and, and, and the USB-C folks, they pushed hard on this with us, and, and in the end, I appreciate them doing it, because they were right. Um, here's what I would tell you, two things. Could tell you a lot of things, but we don't have time. Two things, one is, the, the, the pushback that I got, and it was proper, was, Bart, do you want to be a sport or not? Bowling, do you want to be a sport or not? If you want to be a sport, you got to act like a sport. Don't tell me you want to be a sport, and, and then not do what a sport does. Now, my daughter is a competitive softball player uh, at, at a very pretty high level and would like to play you know, D1 ball. If she ever thought about stepping on the field without warming up in some fashion, what do you think would happen to her? Well, worse than getting hurt. Worse than that. That's the easy part. Bench. Yes, sir, you're right. The coach would sit her on the bench. If she disrespected the game and showed no more respect for that game than to properly loosen up as she's supposed to do with her team, her little hiney is on the bench. The best thing that could happen to her is she could act like she pulled a hammy and she's hurt. Okay? My point is, do you want to be a sport? Be a sport. Now, picture Peter, and I know Peter, so I can pick on him a little. If I'm in a room with a bunch of newbies that are new people, and I ask all of them to stand up, or I'm out on the approach, I ask all of them to stand up and we're going to do calisthenics, what are they going to do? They're going to do exactly what you tell them. They're going to do exactly what you tell them. Have, have any of you, I'm going to come right to you, Paula, have, have any of you ever hosted or watched, it, watched any high school bowling? Do they loosen up? I've seen a lot of them loosen up. How about collegiate bowling? Collegiate bowling does. High school bowling probably should. <laughs> Excuse me. But in collegiate bowling, I've seen some high school, like in state finals, and I've seen them, seen them loosen up. So my, my point is, and we don't have a, a lot of time to, to, to drag on, but my, my point is that the coaching group pushed on us, and, and it was right, that if you want to be a sport, you've got to act like a sport. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want to teach new people about the lifelong game and you want to be a sport, then do that. If you don't want to be a sport, then don't be a sport. So we, but I appreciate you bringing that up because it comes up every time. So I will tell you that um, your new people, the students that are in your class, they're going to follow your lead. If you tell them, well, we don't do that, then they're not going to do that. But if you go out and, and, and do that, and that's part of what, what you do as, as your lessons, that's what they'll do. Hey, you know what? I, I'm not a great tennis player. I don't play a lot of tennis. But if I took some tennis lessons and the tennis coach said, now, Bart, we're going to stretch, am I going to stand there and not stretch? I'm going to do what the heck he tells me, or she tells me. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to do that. So anyway, great point on that. Paula, did you? <laughs> yeah, so high school. Here's the thing. As I get older, I, I warm up without even knowing it. I just have to, or I'll, I'll die, you know, but it's not organized. So you certainly do. So let, let me move on a couple of things about the video there that I, I want to make sure we, we point out. Anybody notice, nobody mentioned the music. Yeah, loud. I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, we launched this at Summit in January, and uh, you know, some of you may, I hope, uh, weren't, weren't there, but some folks, were, a lot of folks were there during the kickoff, and one well-respected proprietor, I have a lot of respect for, piped up and I said, well, what do you like, what do you don't like? He said, Bart, I hate the music. And I said, perfect. We didn't make it for you. And what I meant by that was, with all respect, we made it for today's user, today's adult. And you think about the multi-sensory world we live in. Do you ever do anything single in, anymore, one thing? You know, today's uh, aging youth will tell us, why can't you just stay focused and do one thing? Because we live in a multi-sensory society, we do many things. Okay, so the music was a, uh, it, it, there was a, a method to the madness. Okay, and, and having that music, it's multi-sensory. Did you notice the little vignettes where they swoosh in and out? You mentioned that there was a lot going on, but you, you know that it was a little snippet, swoosh, back in, snippet. And that was all designed with today's learner in mind. I mean, and I'm not saying it's right. I mean, we could have a big discussion about society and what we do and don't do, but, but the fact is, today's learner, we do things in bite size. We live in a microwave society. We don't want to work harder than five minutes for anything. You know, if you can't... If you can't do it in five minutes or less, you know, and I'm not judging it, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm saying that's just how we had to design it. So you'll notice that, you know, traditional learning in America many years ago was very linear. You started at point A, you went to point Z, and you never thought about taking any detours. You never thought about taking any interruptions. It's as Americans, it's how we grew up, it's how we learned in that linear society. And in today's society, not judging it right or wrong, we learn in, in snippets. We learn in... 140 characters or less. So the, the methodology on that teaching, while subtle, was all very, you know, uh, deliberate. Now, is it right or not? I, I, I don't know. But it was all very de deliberate there. 
Here's what I would say about the video, and I do appreciate your, your feedback on, on things there. Um, yeah, there's a couple mistakes in there. Yeah, there's a couple things maybe that uh, if we had to, to shoot it over, we would do different. Um, you know, we could have needled it to death, but we wanted to bring a product to market and we thought we had something usable. The beauty of the program is, at this point, as an instructor, you highlight and facilitate the things you want them to know and remember. Right? If there's something in that video that, that you don't like, don't talk to it. If there's something in the video that just rubs you and you say, I've got to speak to this, then address the group and say, hey, I noticed you were sitting on the ball return. We don't do that. You know, so you can speak to it and use it as an aid uh, and, and, and highlight the things that you like about it and, and things that you don't. Look, I had to remind myself in this project that uh, it was the International Bowling Campus and not Bart's Family Fun Center because there's some things I would have done differently in there, but I was part of a bigger team, so I didn't get my way on, on all of it. I often scratch my head about the 10% rule on the ball. I said, look, where's the 19-pound ball? You know, I said, I'm getting older and bigger. I don't see a 19-pound ball. But it's, it's what we teach to, is what's still used in the school system. So I have to appreciate that, okay? But so as, a, as an instructor and a facilitator, okay, I, I then can pick out the things that are important to me. I can pick out the things that resonate with me, and those are the things that I speak to and teach to while I have my, my 5 to 10 to 15 minutes. Does that make sense? Because while I don't think it's perfect, I think it's pretty darn good. And uh, quite candidly, not a one of us in this room could afford to do it. You know, we, just, we just couldn't do it. What do, you think it what do you think it would cost, or did cost, or would cost, to put a video series like that together with filming and editing and all that stuff? What do you think? Throw me a number. Five grand. I wish it was only that. 75000 Now you're getting warm. You're pretty darn close. So, yeah, that, that is a, on a video shoot, I will tell you that that's about a fifty to $75,000 project with editing and sound and equipment and all those type things. So it's, it's fairly, uh, it's a huge capital investment. I mean, it's not for the faint at heart, okay? And a small business operator, that's just not, that's not the sandbox we're in. It's not the sandbox I'd be in. Now, you know what we paid for that? Zero. It was just a lot of sweat equity, blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of people's time. All of the uh, time was donated through USB-C, all the filming, all the editing, all the equipment. It was a great collaboration. So that's why we can bring that kit to market for $49. Okay? If I've got a $50,000, it's just like your business. If I've got a $50,000 note that I have to spread across my project, it ain't happening at $49 a kit. But when I don't have that $50,000 note that it's all done gratis as part of the partnership with USB-C, Strike 10, and BPA, then I can bring to market a product that, that is at a, just, it's like a ridiculous, sometimes I feel like the ShamWow guy, you know, because it's like, it's ridiculous to come before you and say that I've got bowlers in a box for 49 bucks. I feel like, you know, like I should have a microphone hanging down the face. And it's just, it's goofy, but it's, it's, it's real. So the, the, the point is that not having that cost structure allows us to bring to market that product for you much better. So we know it's not perfect. We know that it's, it's, it has some tweaks and things that can be done. But I think for all of us, there's things we can pull out of there that we can use to make, you know, we can speak to and do the teaching. Okay? Because um, <clears throat> this is kind of like, um, and I don't smoke, but I needed a cigarette after this was done. You know, it was like a labor of love to bring this thing. It was, it was like bringing something to, to, to life. And um, it's kind of like a marriage. For better or worse, we're done. You know, it's, it's staying like it is, and, and we're going to use it, And because the worst thing we can do is tweak it because you give us some feedback, and you give us some feedback. We got version 3, then we got version 4, and then you need to buy another video and get it updated. We just said, look, let's bring this to market. It's, it's got some shelf life. It's ready to go. Let, let's make it happen. <clears throat> now, let's, th let's talk a little bit about uh, coaches and, and lesson one here, because I want to share with you. Let me check my time. Okay, got to get going. Um, I often get questions about how many coaches should I have? Bart, how many coaches should I have? In a perfect world, it would be great to have one for every pair. But I know we don't live in a perfect world. People call in sick. We're short of resources and things of that nature. So I will tell you that I think that you can have one for every two pair. Any more than that, you stretch it. It's just It gets diluted. You can't do it. Now, when I say one for every two pair, it's under the model, and, and you all can use the model that, that you like, but it's under the model that you have a lead instructor, and then you have one coach for every two pair. So if I've got eight lanes going, if I've got 32 people in my bowling 2.0, under the, under the model that I would present to you, I need three people. 
I need kind of a lead instructor, and then I need my two assistants. And kind of the methodology there is I like teaching in a group because I want, the, I want all of you to have some affinity and, and work together and learn together and grow together because you know what? On week five, you're going to bowl together. You just don't know it yet. Okay? Now, I haven't told you when you signed up that on week five you're coming back for my program, but it's like a timeshare. You're doing it. Okay? <laughs> you're, you're, you're coming back. So I need, you to, I need you to learn together and grow together and have some affinity together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count you off. One, two, three, four. You're lane one. One, two, three, four. You're lane two. So when I'm teaching, I'm saying, all right, all ones up on the approach. Let's find our sp starting spot. And we all walk together, right? And I say, okay, ones, let's do that again. So if I'm the master instructor, if I'm the lead instructor, my other folks are just helping me so they can spend more time. If they have to individually teach eight people how to do something, they can't do it. It's too rough. But if they're reinforcing what I'm speaking to, they can, they can cover more ground. Does that make sense? It's kind of a teaching method. So then I'm, okay, all the twos. Two's up. Let's go. Let's find your spot. One, two, three, four, turn, pivot. And then we do that again. And that's how I like to do the class in, in the learning. So you've got that person. And that way, <coughs> excuse me, I can have somebody that is a, 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 a you know, halfway decent bowler that's better one-on-one, -on -one, because not everybody likes to get in front of a group, do they? So some coaches don't want to get in front of a group. They're better one-on-one. -on -one. They'll come down and help you and, and, and work with you. So that's the methodology that, that we, we teach to or recommend. Now, look, there are programs happening all across the country, and they're doing it a lot of different ways, okay? <clears throat> I look at this as a, a marketing cost. I don't look at it as, as a free cost. If I'm going to have three coaches, and I'm going to pay them for two or three hours a week, it's a payroll cost. You know, it's a payroll cost. It's a marketing cost. It's a, it's a program cost to, to be able to, to, to make it happen. Uh, best practice, we do not recommend keeping score in week one. Do not keep score. The worst thing you can do is start to show someone their skill level, engage them, and, and have them have a score before they're even learning your, your, your game. You know, you don't, wanna, you, don't, you don't go out and play 18 holes of golf and keep score on the golf card before you, you do the lessons, do you? If you're doing a program. So don't keep score. Just put the pin setters on. Because you think about, think about week one. If you've got 32 people and you have to find a ball, find your starting spot, start to learn the, the four-step approach without the ball, and go through all that, how much time are you really going to have to bowl? Not much. And that's okay. You want to leave them wanting more. That's okay. They're not going to do, do a tremendous amount of bowling on week one. You know, some folks like to include safety tips. Some folks take them and tour the pin setters, you know. Uh, but you're not going to do a lot of bowling on week one. But don't keep score. I'll just show you quickly, <laughs> for sake of time, week two we go through posture, arm swing, pins, targeting, cool down. And we recommend, and this is hard for some folks, we recommend still not keeping score in week two. And here's the methodology. You haven't taught them to shoot a spare yet. Why would you want to track score if you haven't shot a spare? I don't want to keep score in golf if I haven't learned how to putt. Right? I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to start keeping score in tennis if I haven't learned how to serve. How much fun is that? So until you get to the point that you're teaching them spares, it's better not to keep score. So we recommend not keeping score in week two because they're still building some of those fundamentals. Now week three, we, we want to keep score because everybody wants to know how they're doing. That's where we teach the 369 uh, spare system, <coughs> the, the keep in, splits, alignment, wrist position, balance arm, uh, th things of that nature. So now it's time to keep score when we've, uh, when we've walked them through that. Let me go to. Now, on week four, this is money week, okay? Because this is the week that we get to convert. This is the week we convert. This is where we close the sale. And this is where it's important to have, you know, this is where it's more about being a salesperson than it is a coach. Because now I want to go to Bob and I want to say, Bob, you had a great time. You're coming back next week, right? Yeah, and, and Bob's coming back. You know, now I want to teach Bob a little something, but first and foremost, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a business person. And I've invested four weeks of money with coaches and uh, POS material. I've got some hard money in this. I need to make the register ring on week five. So that's where I get, I get my payback. So week four, while I want them to have a great time, Week four is really all about closing the sale. Now, uh, I'm not going to show you uh, lesson four or parts of it. I will tell you that in lesson four, I think we did a very nice job, led by USBC, on walking fo folks through the pro shop experience. 
We walk them through, you know, getting a bowling ball, you know, drilling that ball, what it means to them. Uh, and then actually we close, we close with a little vi video about the, the Hall of Fame and the campus so they get this kind of bigger picture of what's going on, this bowling 2.0 movement. We want it to be something that's happening at Bob Center, but it's happening around the country and it's tied in with your Hall of Fame and Museum and tied in with the, uh, the, the International Bowling Campus. So it's meant to be something, you know, bigger than just what's happening at your center. But we did hook you a little bit in the end. If, you've, if any of you have seen week four, we, we come back on week four and we tell you, Peter, I hope you've had a great time, but the fun doesn't stop now. Your bowling center has a program starting next week. We hope you'll join us. So we've, we've put you on the hook that you've got to start something. I mean, you literally, as an operator, have to stop the video and say, we're not doing that. We don't need any, any business. Okay, we, we don't want you to come back in week five. So as a team, while we gave you a lot of latitude on the free versus paid and said you as a business operator have to decide what's best for you and we respect that, we did not give you latitude on if you're going to start something on week five because that's the reason we're here. Okay? That's the reason we're here. There's other great programs just to teach people how to bowl. We're here to teach people how to bowl and convert them on week five. So that's what we want to do. So we've, we put that hook in there and it's, it's very deliberate, it's very intentional, and we don't apologize. Okay? Because we want you to get better, we want your business to grow. So we put that, we put that, that hook in there. So I'm going to go past that. And let's talk quickly about the, I'm going to come right to you, Bob. Let's talk about the conversion on what to do for week five. Because that's where your creativity comes in and you put in whatever type of program you'd like. We certainly teach to the eight for eight. We think that's a great one. But we certainly understand that some of you, uh, your margins and such, you know, you just for whatever reason, it needs to be a 10 for 10 or a 12 for 12. Look, I don't care if you do a 35 for 35. If you can pull it off, God bless you, man. Make it happen. But here's what we know. This I will tell you. Our studies show, and I think logically, if you think about this intuitively, this makes perfect sense to us, the smaller the amount of weeks of the commitment, the higher the conversion. Does that make sense? The smaller the amount of weeks, the higher the conversion. The facts are the facts. So we can argue about, do we, should we do short seasons? Does it bad for the industry? I, I'm just telling you that the studies show all things being equal, if I have an eight-week program versus a 12-week program, my conversion is different. Because the, these new people that you're talking to, their commitment level is much less than your traditional guest. It just is. So if you're looking for something that is set and ready to go, the eight for the eight's there for you. If you need to do your own thing, do your own thing. We just want you to do something, whether that's 10 for 10, 12 for 12, pizza and pop, you know, what fun leagues, Pitcher and beer leagues, I, whatever it is, we don't care. Just do something. Do something and, 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 and make it fun. Bob, you had a question? <clears throat> yeah, Bob's question was, you know, how do you integrate them in league bowling? Do you start moving them into that team concept? Do you get them in that idea of that stuff? Uh, and the answer to all that is yes, you know, as, 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 as much as you can. And, and one key point, and uh, this goes to some of the success. I'm going to share with you a couple of success stories, and with that, share with you a few best practices. And, and Bob, maybe this will, will answer that. Um, Kathleen, she's our poster gal for uh, success so far. I, I will share with you from, from her that uh, she was our center outside of um, Baltimore, Maryland, 24 lanes, probably quite honestly a market that maybe has room for 18. And <laughs> she had 60 people sign up for the program, 44 attended the, the, finished the program, four weeks, and then 28 started into to her program on week five. She actually had 32, but four of them were over the counter. And so we didn't want to distort the results. She actually started an eight by four. So let me run through that, Bob, with you very quickly, what, what happened here. Because <clears throat> we went to Kathleen, we did this over the uh, Christmas holidays. So we had that two-week window that we believe there would be a lot of new people coming in that just take advantage of the holidays and don't normally bowl. So the first question Kathleen asked, that we asked her, was, when do you want to start a new league? Not when do you want to do a 2.0. She said, Bart, I'd love to, to have a league on Friday night at 6.30. She said, I've got 24 lanes, I've got like 16 full, it's that traditional setting of, of over the years, you know, that's dropped two teams or three teams every year, and I'm down to, you know, 16 teams now. I said, great. So you've got eight lanes. You want to start a new league? She said, yes. I said, are you willing to give it away for four weeks in hopes that you'll start something on week five? Because you will display some revenue. Because while she wasn't busy, she did have a little bit of open play. You know, maybe one or two lanes, depending on the night. But it didn't get busy until, like, 9 o'clock after the first shift ended. Sound familiar to most of our centers across America on a Friday? you know, in, in, in January. So that was her scenario. She said, Bart, if you're telling me this will work and you're telling me we can do this, then I'll, I'll, I'm not crazy about free, but I'll do it. 
so she did the program. We, we you know, did it as pres prescribed, and it worked. And it worked because her and her team got behind it. Now, Bob, to your point, <clears throat> she called me up about a week in, and she said, Bart, I've got families that want to join with kids. What do I do? And I said, this is going to be hard for you to hear, but I want you to, to hear me on this. Tell them no. How can I do that? Why, why wouldn't we take everybody? That doesn't make any sense. I said, what, think about the end. What are you going to start on week five? Well, it's going to be a fun mixed league in couples. I said, are you going to have kids? No, no. Then why would you have kids in your program? If you're starting with the end in mind, why would you have kids in your program? Now, not as harsh as just saying no. I said, there's an opportunity. Do you have a time you could do an adult child bowling 2.0? She said, well, yeah, I guess I could. So when I say no, it's not that we don't want to develop youth or we don't want to develop seniors or we don't want to develop adult child, but the affinity is if I'm starting with the end in mind and I want to start an 8x4 mixed league, and I know that's pretty much going to be couples or, or young adults or whatever that target market is, then that's the group I want to sign up for the program. I don't want to have a, I don't want to, because I don't want to do it for free. I don't want to have adults and kids there as a family bowling for free on Friday at 6.30 if that's not what I'm trying to start. I'd love to get them Sunday at 2 in the afternoon if that's when I'm going to start my adult child program. So you think about that with the end in mind, and, and you, 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 you've got to start with that group because you're getting that aff affinity of people that are likely to, to go together and stay together. Okay? I think there's a tremendous market for this outside our bowling centers, going to talking to companies and civic groups and, and organizations. There is a huge movement in our country, we'll talk a little bit about it on Thursday, with health care, and I don't want to start a political discussion because, you know, you all are friends and you don't talk about religion or politics among friends. Um, but I know this, we can take some lemons and, and, and make some lemonade because the big hot button right now is health and wellness. If I can go across the street from your bowling center and go into Best Buy and say, I've got a health and wellness program for your team, I'll teach everybody in your company to bowl for free in four weeks, and it's going to be great. Now, what I don't tell them is on week five, they're rolling over into a new program because they're going to have the Best Buy Fun Club or the Best Buy 8 for 8 or the Best Buy whatever it is, right? Now, they don't know it, but that's what they're going to do. I can do this with churches, civic organizations, anywhere where two or more gather, anywhere where I've got an affinity of people together to, to go do. So that's how we get out to this market of this, this 200 you know, million is, is getting, outside the, uh, getting outside the doors. Okay? Success comes in a lot of different ways. So don't get caught up in the big numbers and saying, well, if I do a program and only had 20 or 30, it's all relative to your marketplace. You know, I will tell you that uh, 16 new bowlers in a small town in Michigan during, during June might be ecstatic and exciting. You know, 16 new bowlers in Dallas, Texas, where the business is pretty good all year round, may be okay. So success is relative to your location, your market, and for some of you that are north of the Mason-Dixon line, it's relative to the seasonality, and, and we get that. Uh, but, but we know that these programs, they, they really work all, all around the country. Um, last thing I, I want to share with you is, while I told you that the kit itself was in stone, meaning that we've got this program we bring into market and it's pretty well set, we do have a living, breathing document, and that is our Step to Success Guide. And that is where we're taking things that you're teaching us and learnings, and this is the part that we, it's a living, breathing document that we share, and, and we kind of get those best practices, because you, you learn great from peer-to-peer -peer learning. This document is on the website that I started off the afternoon showing you. Uh, it's there. It's one of those things that I would recommend you check in every couple months, because as I hope some of you will be sending stuff in, whether you have uh, tricks of the trade, things that you try that work, because this is the part where we can learn and grow together and we can share those, uh, those best practices. Because I don't want to mess with this. Okay, this may not be perfect, but it's pretty darn good. We're going we're gonna to leave it just like it is. It's as close as we're going to get to Kathy's bowler in a box. But this is a breathing, living document that we can share and, and do some best practices. And this is going to be updated and, and put, on the, uh, put on the site there for you. In fact, it's, it's already there. Uh, I hope that if you have additional questions, You'll stop by the BPA booth. Again, I feel a bit like the ShamWow guy, but I don't know why any center in America wouldn't have a, a Bowling 2.0 kit. I'll close with this. I've been very blessed and fortunate to travel the world and, and see a lot of different centers and scenarios. And we know that certain things work in certain markets and certain things don't work in markets. So that's so why we get together and, and share and, you know, it, it frustrated and, and make you feel better. You know, we just know that not everything works in every market, with the exception of a few things. 
I will tell you that this program, I believe in my heart of hearts, is one of those absolutes. That it doesn't know race, it doesn't know gender, it doesn't know income, it doesn't know weather. It's one of those programs that every Bowling Center in America could start a program. Now, success will come in different ways. It might be 16 in Nebraska and 106 somewhere else. But if you follow the steps, this program is an absolute. It does work. And, and you've proven that, you being your peers, as you've executed the programs. And it, so it just does. So we're, that's why we're so excited about it, and that's why you hear so much stuff. Um, I'm going to hang around here for a few minutes. I'll take some questions because I know we're right on time. I appreciate you sitting in today. I hope you fill out your surveys and have a great rest of uh, Bowl Expo there. Thank you.